come once again to discuss things. Okay, hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Geeky Gentlemen. I am Sid Part 2. Joining me today is Connor Nielsen for the final episode of Geeky Gentlemen Holiday Month. This episode will actually be posted after Christmas Day. Uh, if you're clever, there is a way to watch Geeky Gentlemen episodes early. I'm not going to tell you how to do it. You have to figure that part out on your own. So you could have watched this before Christmas. Just say it. <laughs> it's on you. It's on you. Anyway, Connor, what are we talking about today? Today we are going to be talking about Grant Morrison and Dan Mora's seven-issue miniseries from Boom Studios called Klaus. This Mm -hmm. began, uh, I think it came out, the first issue hit November of 2015, and it's been, was supposed to be monthly. It came out (laughs) later and later uh, throughout the year of 2016, and it wrapped up, I want to say, two or three months ago. And it's kind of Santa Claus year one, so to speak. Well... I, it's funny, I was talking about this with the current Wonder Woman series. Calling something year one means that it has to encompass a year, which this clearly does not. Yeah. <laughs> That's something that thoroughly annoys me. When, like, the, the first arc of, uh, or the, the the year one arc of Greg Rucka's Wonder Woman is about to wrap up in the next issue, and it will have definitely not been a year. And so, that just... That's a bad use of title. Yeah. So don't, but I've heard people say that. I've heard people say that. Connor, I'm always excited when Geeky Gentleman chooses to review something, and I know for a fact going into the review that we're going to have the best review of it online. <laughs> because what I'll do on occasion just to get a general feel for what people think of the book is I will watch other people's reviews of a book or movie, or whatever. There are other reviews of this. They are awful reviews. Oh my god. Tell me about them. It's hilarious. There's like one, it's, like, all of them are like one or two minutes long. It's just people saying, oh yeah, it's really good, or no, this is really bad, and then not explaining why. Oh. (laughs) So, and most of them are just talking about, like, an individual issue, but still, I find that really amusing, that people don't understand how to do a review get post a review yeah <laughs> it happens i remember like a similar thing happened when we talked about Django zorro yeah exactly exactly uh anyway so yes klaus volume or uh, i i was assuming that he was going to keep going with this i didn't realize that these seven issues were it well they were it but because they I was I was really surprised that they started releasing this in November of 2015, and the original intention was for this to be a six issue miniseries. And then mm-hmm. once the third issue hit, all of a sudden, like the first issue says one of six, then it says two of six, but then it says three of seven. And then they had changed their plans and made it a seven issue miniseries, and it wrapped up sometime I want to say in like the late summer or something. They had a very inopportune time, and I was surprised they didn't just release this as a graphic novel just at the holiday times. Um, but I think that's kind of the intent is like, I, it's, it's weird with the way that um, pricing works and, and how they can afford to do something. I think that they knew it would sell better as a graphic novel, but there wouldn't be enough immediate return to just sell it as a graphic novel. Yeah. Um, and so selling it as monthly, helped pay for itself so that long term it'll sell better and then they released maybe the sexiest hardcover i've seen since the multiversity hardcover oh dude i'm holding it right now the cover just it feels amazing and i love the pages have like that reflective edging yeah the gilded pages are beautiful oh it, it is and like i i'm not lying this is a beautiful fucking cover they even put like gold inlay in some of the um the lines of the de- the, the uh, reindeer antlers. Yeah, it's really it's, cool. I, I went to Barnes and Noble and just read a little bit out of it the other day. Um, it's so amazing. Like, there's artwork, 
like on and inside the hardcover before you get to the book that isn't <laughs> in the book. Like really? they went all out on like the like Dan Mora obviously had a lot of concept art and really liked the visual design uh, that he and Morrison came up with this and it's such a you I will get into it but the the I love this actually book. I'm looking <laughs> through it I don't see any artwork that's not in the story. Oh, really? Oh, maybe... Yeah, I mean, besides the variant covers posted in the back. Hmm. I could have sworn there was something like, when you turn it... Yeah, there's, I mean, there's artwork, but I know it's, I know it's... From oh, the... okay. Maybe you need to go back and relook at it. Because I, I, um, I read the first two issues back in November and December when they came out, but then when I read the third issue, it was like January or something, and I thought, you know what, I'm just going to hold off till next, uh, holiday season till I read it because mm -hmm. I figured that would be a better time. Uh, but they did, I haven't gone to the comic shop and picked it up, but this last Wednesday, they did release a Klaus 80-page one-off. And I think it's oh, called really? uh, Klaus and the Witch of Winter. Interesting. And it is Morrison and Mora, so I gotta go back and pick it up. I finally finished it right before this review, um, and I loved this book. I loved it so much. And it, it's, it's Morrison, I love Morrison, and it's hard when you read Morrison, to not say, oh my gosh, this is my new favorite thing by him. Because um, he's, <laughs> right. he's such a dynamic writer, he can do so many different things, and while I still think multiversity might be his greatest achievement, this might be my favorite thing he's written. Um, there, it, he is one of those writers that, like, it's hard to tell when it's him sometimes. I don't think he has a very consistent style. He like you when he's doing the the really big universal stuff. I feel like you can tell it's him. Yeah. But he also has the ability to do a small scaled down story really well when he wants to. Um. I I think he's a very versatile writer, and and this kind of shows it because this is written, in a lot of ways, like a fairy tale. Uh -huh. Like, I was reading some reviews, and again, they're very poorly um, making any points. If and making points, if any at all, but um, like one person was like, the dialogue is just so hackney, and I'm like, what? Yeah, but the thing is, I kind of see where that's coming from, but it's an intentional choice to make it sound like kind of a you know bedtime story. Right, uh, that's exactly what I got from it. Yeah, like it's it's meant to be kind of over the top and and a little bit hammy. It's not meant to be subtle writing. Um, they're like, oh, so much just unbelievable crap happens in the first issue. It's a fairy tale. That's you're talking about a story about Santa Claus. Come on now, it's a fairy tale. Yeah, and of course, there's like some <laughs> mythic town that once had great Christmases, but now doesn't because it's being ruled by an evil guy with a wife that he doesn't love and an evil child and yada yada. I That's... I can't believe. Okay, this book is so charming. And I, I I read this all in one go, and so I didn't, like, you know, read it as it was coming out. But this reads so well as a singular piece, and had I, mm -hmm. if I was reading this monthly, I mean, I, I'm, I'm kind of berating myself that I didn't read this when it was coming out, because it's so charming, and it's it, it plays perfectly to my sensibilities, where it has a heightened sense about itself. It, mm -hmm. um, it, like, there's a scene in the... the fourth issue where the the wife and her child are playing with toys i almost cried while reading that and that is a brilliant and fucking i don't scene. know why and i mean i know why but it snuck up on me and it got and the, and the and the way they had seeded the whole relationship and the history it's such a rich mythology that when mm -hmm. and and it was such a human moment and maybe i guess the dialogue worked so well with me is because I've been in Star Wars land for the last week or so. Yeah. Um, and so it had a very similar heightened way about itself that, say, a fairy tale like Star Wars has about itself. And uh, I, I really, really liked it. So I take it you liked it too. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's Morrison. He hasn't written anything that I don't at least like on some level. There's stuff that I'm like, eh, it was good, just not my thing. Um, but no, Morrison's a brilliant writer and I did love this. And like what you were talking about, the scene with the mother and her son, what's really interesting is that that happens after she meets Klaus again. Mm -hmm. And just from that point on, she is drawn with just so much hope in her eyes, just everything about her. She like, 
just gets life breathed back into her by meeting him again. And and she's suddenly just so much more joyous throughout the rest of the book. I love it. I um, And I love Dan Mora's art. Um, this guy is so young. Oh, my God. This is, like, in the back of the book. Dan Mora was born in 87. Wow. Wow. This dude is so fucking young, and he looks like a goddamn pro. He looks like he's been doing this for decades. They're, they're, um, I, a lot of this is in his art, and I, I want, I'm looking at who does the colors, uh, oh my, did he do the colors too? Because it says, illustrated by Dan Mora, letters by Ed Dukeshire. I think he also did the colors. Yeah, I'd have to assume so. Um, wow! Um, because the colors were my favorite thing, and it was working so well with the pencils and the inks that I, I was kind of assuming that, um, the nighttime looking it looks incredible. The weird tripping balls spirit scenes look incredible. I love the spirit scenes so um, much. The first one is gorgeous. It is. It's it's funny, it reminds me of um you haven't read Morrison's eighteen days, have you? No, I, I didn't. I'm sorry. Um it's it's worth picking up, but like the first issue opens with this like explaining how the universe came to be and <laughs> shit. Uh, which if anyone's gonna do it, it's Grant Morrison. Yeah. Um <laughs> But, like, and it's just this explosion of color that I just wish I was on acid for that first time I saw it, <laughs> right? And, and like, the, the image is so good, that ended up being the cover of the first volume. And so it really reminds me of that, where it just looks so absolutely jaw-droppingly beautiful. It's, it is seriously just, it's like watching paint melt while you're on acid for that two-page spread. It's gorgeous. And, like... You're just so blown away by how abstract and how beautiful everything is that you have to really spend time and go back and look at each individual panel to see what's happening so that you so that the reveal two pages later can make sense. Um, yeah. I love that about it. It, I don't know, man. I have a real thing. I, I get a real hard on for sensory overload art. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's something that's it's hard to do outside of film or videos um it is it's, it's, it's very it's, difficult. like you can do that with music but then you you risk losing something which is why music tends to be more emotionally impactful the more minimalistic it is um but i it's something i i love to see in art when you have a million little tiny details that it takes years for everyone to notice and i and i love just like blowing you away so that you have to analyze every little thing about it. And that this book has a lot of that. Yeah, when I was flipping through the hardcover, and it's in a deluxe format, it's oversized, um, it was almost overwhelming when I was first reading it. Like that first two-page spread of him looking at, uh, what's what's this town called? Um, oh, uh, Grimsvig? Grimsvig, that's it. Um, and when he's looking at Grimsvig through the mountains, there was so much detail and visual information being conveyed that I, I, I spent like a couple minutes just looking at those two pages and I already read comics slow enough as it is. So yeah, like, like seriously folks, it's uh it's about four o'clock my time, about one o'clock Connor's. We were supposed to record at three. I messaged Connor at three and he's like, yeah, I just got one more issue to finish. So it'll just be a couple minutes. And I sat there for an hour waiting for him. I'm so sorry. Okay, now, now, now in my defense, uh, even though I don't need a defense, because there's no defense for this, uh, it was, um, I think that last page was like, that last issue was like 30-something pages, which is about 10 pages longer than usual, and there's a lot going on, and I just was spending so much time soaking in all the art, and then time got away, and oh my god, yeah. It's it's hilarious. One, one thing that, to note, though... Such a slow comic. <laughs> I, and, yeah, I mean... The usual 20, 22 page comic takes me about a half an hour to read as it is. Um, <laughs> but I think I was I was going through most of these, uh, which they're about 24 pages each chapter. And I, I have all the issues in my hands right now. But um, there's no ad. There was no ad in the books, in the issues when I was. Oh, yeah. Did Boom do that thing? Like, the, I'm pretty sure they do that with King Kong. Uh the King Kong book I'm reading right now where they put all the ads at the end, right? Um, yeah, there's, like, one... I mean, there's the letters page, and then there's, like, a We Are Boom Studios thing, and that's it. Yeah, I gotcha. Um, and what's cool is, I, and 
I mean, these were three ninety nine per issue, mm-hmm. uh, and I think maybe there's a little bit more of a price hike there because there is no ads in there. And honestly, uh, I think ads really slow, like make <laughs> me read comics even slower because you know there's you have to like jump around. You have to like after each ad, you have to sort of you, it, it's it's like a subliminal thing where you have to try to remember where you were before the ad, even though you probably know where you are. It takes us just that few seconds to. You get you get it gets chopped up a little bit and uh, yeah. uh, it's it's funny in the um in when when DC Rebirth just did their launch uh, <laughs> there was this uh, Doomsday ad that involved like Snickers oh my god yeah and like there was in an issue of Action Comics with Doomsday you're reading a Superman Doomsday fight and then on the next page there you see Doomsday charging at Superman and Batman. And then Batman hands Doomsday a Snickers, and it turns out to be Wonder Woman. And it's, like, really fucking confusing. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. It's really funny. And then I remember, like, that advert. It was, like, a four-page ad. And then they just condensed it to a single-page ad with four panels on it. I'm like, why didn't you just do that to begin with? Oh, just because. And Rebirth is just, oh, my God. It's a sin of how many ads they have in each issue. But, um... Regardless of that, back to Claws. Yeah, but uh, no, I, tying anyway. up back to Claws, though, is without any ads, it flows so well. I wanna, I picked up each issue right after the other. I wasn't counting pages while I was reading it. I just went through them and through them, and it was such a natural progression from each issue to the next. I imagine this reads incredible in trade. Oh, yeah, it's, it's perfect in trade. It's almost like I love the cover pages, and the cover of each issue and what's weird is the cover of each issue as you go into the next one it just doesn't feel like a break it just feels like a big one page panel um like one page uh piece of art that's continuing the story so it doesn't feel like you're you're breaking and it's the end of a chapter it just feels like the next step of the story and so that one page just serves as additional story. Yeah. Um, the way they set up these covers, it's so cool. Uh, not all of them, but some of them in the trade feel that way. Mm-hmm. And, like, you know, issue four starts the flashback, so that one's kind of it, it, iffy, but still. Um, uh, so much of that just works. Like, issue, I was, as I was saying that, I was looking at um, the cover for issue two going into issue three, and that's just claws up on a roof. And mm-hmm. as the guards pass beneath them and stuff, and uh, that uh, I I almost oh my god! And what's really cool is each issue is it. Like, I'm having trouble remember what happens in each issue, but I also because remember they, all blend, together they, they so. blend together so well. But at the same time, I remember issue two is the one where Klaus has one line of dialogue, and he's in twelve panels across four pages in that entire twenty-four page story. Um, and it's just okay. and it's just him trapped in Grimsvig trying to get out. And honestly, I was reminded heavily of Batman Year One, where uh, it's him stuck in the one place while the police are trying to hunt him down. And I honestly thought there was actually quite a bit of Miller in Morrison's. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Morrison went back to Miller, especially in uh, how enthusiastic he is about revolution and. Uh, I mean, not quite to the extent of Miller, and it is more heightened and optimistic than a Miller book, but the, it is still there, and I think uh, it's really nice, uh, you know, informing the story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. I'm just reading through that issue real quick, trying to see if I can find what you're talking about. And yeah, so he only has the one line in issue two, and a Mary Yule time to you too. That's interesting. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I really like so much of this. It's just so damn good. <laughs> uh, I, I'm looking through issue to issue, and I love how much of this, like, it's San- it, it feels like how Santa Claus would fight. Yeah, it does. Like, I love that, like, the guards are standing there, and so he throws a snowball that basically gets, you know, Wiley Coyote cartoon <laughs> physics attached to it to bury the two in snow. And, like, he, knock- he knocks the big-ass dude off of his feet, and then... <laughs> <laughs> Makes him a snowman. <laughs> yeah, just builds a snowman around his ass. That feels to me like how Santa Claus would fight. <laughs> and and it does it does feel very Batman. You're right, it does remind me a lot of Batman Year One, like when Batman's trapped in the um, building and the SWAT team comes in and, and all that. 
that's really brilliant. And I just, I don't know, it's, it's adorable in a weird way. And I love it. It's, it's just cool. Um, now, how do you feel about the sword, given that we're talking about ha- how Santa Claus would fight? I really like it because one thing that I really dig is it's, it's almost like it's definitely a Santa Claus story, but Santa Claus, like what Santa Claus is, is so different mm-hmm. from like this feels almost like a like a Celtic myth almost, and uh, mm-hmm. it's going it's it has so much history and mythology woven into it, and like what the Santa is. So him using a sword didn't really break any illusion to me. It it it, it plays into the fantasy trappings. It plays into uh, the mythology of like I, I want to say Celtic mythology. Um, uh, I think Morrison said it was inspired by like Viking mythology. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Santa and stuff. That that's it's weird. Is there's a guy that looks exactly like Santa on one of these pages. Yeah. Is is it the one guard with the white? Yeah. yeah the white beard. Yeah. And stuff. Um. And, and like uh, the uniforms of the guards, I was the white and uh, red, and they they mentioned that in one of the middle issues. Uh, where the one the one guard like this used to stand for something, but I I've been noticing that throughout the story, and, and I really like how Morrison and Mora don't just explicitly show you the costume, big like, look at this is where Santa Claus got his costume. It doesn't go like that, and I uh, so him using a sword, I'm okay with it because it's playing into the history of like Viking lore and fantasy trappings, but it's also so jolly and merry that it's Santa Claus, right? And I like how. They call it Yule time. They never call it Christmas, mm-hmm. um, and that's neat. Yeah, um, I'm just looking through this, and so far it's weird because he's drawn with the sword on a lot of the covers, but I don't think he uses it at any point. Uh, and to once again to the point about like Batman and and what you were just saying about the way he's like um, you know sneaking around. There's this good panel where he's in conversation with. Um, the the queen or whatever and he's like i'm a yule time spirit a man of mystery i rely on the shadows for a lot of the effects the <laughs> gifts i told you about blah, blah, blah. i don't know i just i like that that's, that that's fun. i i yeah, i think that, this, i don't think i see him use the sword as santa claus uh, oh yeah not not as santa claus i saw i i thought you were talking about when uh he was a guard and he did have a sword and when he found lily or Lily or whatever it is the 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 wolf. yeah yeah I'm just like I'm just trying to figure out because they draw him with a sword a oh lot. there he is uh, he's he's in issue seven he's got his uh, sweet sweet chariot led by wolves and he's got a big oh sword. yeah when he fights the when he fights Krampus oh my God Krampus yes right <laughs> oh yes <laughs> <laughs> he does use it on Krampus I'll give you that um I don't know it's just it's friggin cool it is just a badass version of Santa Claus. Um, and that's neat. Um, yeah. and that's, I remember I had, I want to say I had, when this was first coming out last holiday month, I had mentioned Klaus to you. This was when like the, I don't even think the second issue had quite come out yet. And I, I pitched it the way it was pitched to me where it's almost like dark and gritty Santa Claus origin story, but it's not uh-huh. really dark or gritty. It's just, uh, Viking like origin story for Santa, and you, it, it feels like a real fairy tale, not does. a distant fairy tale. There, there you go. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. And then I, you were like, "Oh, that kind of sounds stupid." Like, but Morrison's writing it, and you went, oh, "Okay, I guess I'll give it a shot." When well, it if it's to- Grant Morrison, <laughs> then it has to be good. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> no, that's that really is it, though. It, it, it's it is kind of like brutal, and it's it's a little rough, but it feels like an actual fairy tale. Like, Haley's got a book of the Grimm fairy tales, the original, you know, Brothers Grimm stuff, and those sh- things are fucking violent as shit. Like, Cinderella and her stepsisters cut off parts of their feet and shit. Oh, yeah. It's, <laughs> like, it's messed up. And there, there are messed up things in fairy tales. The witch burns Hansel and Gretel alive, you know? <laughs> those, there's no getting around that. This has those messed up elements, you know, people are being killed in the mines, and I don't know, maybe there's some commentary there with Christmas being overcapitalized. Maybe. Maybe. It, it's not exactly subtle. Uh, but... And it doesn't need to be, and that's what's cool. Yeah, so, I don't know, I, I think that's really brilliant. Krampus is so fucking cool. I love the design, uh, the 
the skull with the huge tongue and the fire. It's, and I, they were building it up, and I was reading. I'm like, and I, I'd seen them on the covers. And I'm like, is that Krampus? It's got to be. I mean, I they mean, don't give him that by name. Yeah. But that's clearly what it is. You look at like, you know, even the um, the Krampus movie that we reviewed on the uh, last year on holiday month. Um, if you look at like a lot of the imagery of Krampus shown in that, it's not like the Santa Claus looking Krampus that we eventually get. It's more like the traditional. Um, hairy monster monster looking thing with the big ass horns yeah. the one consistent thing is like gigantic fucking horns and uh and when you look at classic and, and then looking at classic designs of Krampus the huge tongue um mm -hmm. the, the fur and so I think it's it's a brilliant design I think he's creepy but awesome and I like I also really like the lettering in this um What's what's his, like that big dude in the second issue who he turns into a snowman? The the oh, yeah. the I can't remember if he comes back later, but he's got no. Yeah, I, I didn't think so, but uh, they do so much great stuff with lettering. Um, where that that character is only in like one issue, but they gave him his own special word balloons and like his own like special effects of letters. He's not just in one issue. He's in one, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine, ten, if you count his foot. Eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, if you count his word balloons. Fifteen panels. Yeah. <laughs> He's in fifteen panels across three pages. And that's, like, such subtle detail. I love it. Just the, the care put into it. There's so much creativity, and what I like is... And what this is just what I like about indie comics in general is the creators have so much enthusiasm about what they're making that it, mm. whether this is your thing or not, you can't deny that the passion is there. And for me, it was infectious. It, it spread to me, and I got so invested. And I like how this starts off almost like a western. And then, yeah, let me actually let me stay on lettering for a sec because I did have something I wanted to pick your brain about because yeah. you see it with let's just call him Krampus, even yeah. though they don't directly. Um, you see it with Krampus, and you also see it in the flashbacks. Uh -huh. Oh my god, I love that. Yeah. His, his origin as a child. How do you feel about giving us word balloons that don't um, do the little tail to tell us who's talking? I'm glad you brought that up, uh, because I really like it. It What it does is it's such a subtle and smart way of conveying that, yes, we are in a different time, but it almost feels like a memory, or a, like, and it's, it's a much more, I think, effective way of it feels detached mm -hmm. and it feels more heightened and it, and it, and it feels more distant because the, and usually when people have a, 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 a flashback, the way they try to convey that sort of feeling is they fray the edges of the, um, of the panel and fade and it look like the, the panels faded on the edges. Yeah. They'll do something with the coloring or something uh -huh. like that. This, I've never seen something like this before. And at first I was slightly confused, but it almost, feels like a dream where you're not kidding. yeah and, and i loved it i loved it so much okay and see for me i'm kind of of two minds about it because i i do like that it is a disconnect and it's it's a change of the conventions but something about it feels like like almost too fundamental a convention to change that it, it's kind of like if you were to to write a book without punctuation and, like, maybe you were doing some, or you'd have to be, maybe you were doing something with that to make a point or to enhance part of the story or something, like, maybe part of, the, like, the, the entire book's all in um, dialogue and every, maybe the point is, like, everybody talks really fast, they never really stop or something like that. Yeah. So, like, maybe that could be fundamentally a point. But at a certain point, I feel like playing with conventions breaks down when you make the thing so different that it becomes harder to read because of it. Um, to the point where it, cause, where it almost breaks readability. I, I, it's used sparingly. I think that is a... It's only used in the flashback scenes, and I think... And, and when Krampus talks. Yeah, and when Krampus talks. But his lettering is so unique. It's so distinct, it, yeah, it doesn't yeah. matter, but... Um, 
I, I'm, I just thought of that related to him, too. Okay. Um, um, but it's definitely in the flashbacks. What, what I like is that he's... He's a he's like a demon. He's so different from every other person. Like even even Santa, he's Klaus. He's he's a person, and so using that to sig- like signify that he's different. And uh, I guess it doesn't really bug me all that much. It, it is used mostly sparingly. Um, like ninety five ninety percent of the time, it is like all the dialogue is connected to somebody. Um, and in those flashbacks, though, they do a good job of placing the word balloons around certain characters so that it. I I personally it never like I ne- I never felt confused but if there's some people are then I understand that um, yeah because it like I adjusted to it quickly enough but I still had to adjust to it you know yeah the first page or so I was like wait hold on is, is somebody like voicing over this uh, and ideally that's not something you want to happen you don't want to feel like you've been taken out of the story right. I, I, um, I suppose so, but upon rereading, it was something I adjusted to really fast, and upon rereading, I won't have that problem. Um, I actually, I think I liked it a lot more than you did, because I, I really dug it, and it was a it was a way I've never seen to convey that we're in a flashback, and the coloring is so dynamic in this, that putting, like, a flashback filter over the coloring, I thought would have, it would have been so typical, and it would have felt, like, I, I don't know, maybe too conventional, so I, I thought it was a really fun, unique way to do that. Yeah, it was an interesting choice. I just, I don't know, something about that. It, it felt like it's kind of, you know, breaking the the holy, like, the, the unwritten rules of comic books or stuff, you know? <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I get where you're coming from. It, it just, it's one of those things where I felt like we should bring it up because it is so fundamentally different than what we're used yeah. to in comics. Um, I love how we get a lot of things about the Santa Claus mythology, Um the ho, yeah, ho, ho. How, how all that's introduced, like the way he, uh, you know, the why does Santa go down the chimney? Well, because people will steal the toys or the guards would take the toys if he left them on the front porch. So he has to get them in the house so people don't yeah. know about them. And, and the the way they, they don't have mailboxes, so they send the, the messages up through the chimney. There's that two-page spread where he's on a rooftop and he sees all the pages coming up. It was... I got goosebumps, man. My nipples were hard. It was amazing. Like that, it's it's art. Like this is art, My man. My nipples were hard. <laughs> you should go on Amazon and write that in the review. But, this book made my nipples hard. It's... And other things too, if you know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> I mean my penis. Hey, what can I say? Redheads really do it for me. So the thing is, um. When it came to uh, the the <laughs> put that on the uh, put that on the, the the quotes on the book. So right? <laughs> Dan Moore's art. Well, I really hope you become a professional reviewer so you can start doing that. I'm tweeting that real quick. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, so so while you're saying that, uh, I one thing that I I like. Um, I like thinking while I'm reading books, and this this does provoke thought. I think I think there's some uh, the stuff with Cole. I think that's a pretty uh, unsubtle uh, commentary that Morrison's trying to do. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. But I and I, I really think that comic the, books are not the place for subtlety. I've come down to that. Yeah, and, and Morrison is maybe one of the least subtle writers in the business, and that's perfectly fine. I, I don't care. Um, I mean, he can be definitely he's definitely subtle when he needs to be. A lot of, there's a lot of really subtle stuff going on in his Batman and Ro- uh, Batman run, Batman and Robin. Um, but, uh, I like, uh, pieces of fiction that make me feel more. I- I'm, I'm a person who likes to feel more than I like to think. And I think Morrison does a really good job of, he's so like Morrison is so good at making stuff that provokes thought and stuff that provokes feelings. And he's such good at just jumping around between the two. But when a, and that's, Part of the reason I really like something like Blade Runner is the more I think about that movie, the more I feel about it. And I've never had that feeling with any other piece of fiction before outside of Blade Runner. But this movie, this this story is so visceral, and it gets it just gets into my heart, and it makes me feel so much, just even from the beginning, and just seeing the the stuff they incorporate into the art and where it and how it just makes me feel, and it 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 hooks me right away, and even stuff that like may or may not take you out, the risks it takes, I never get taken out of the book because it hooked me so instantly and it was so appealing to me very quickly, which is interesting because fantasy is just not really my thing generally. 
Uh, yeah, me either. I'm not a huge fantasy guy, more into sci-fi and stuff like that. Uh, and I'm with you. Uh, and so I, I guess this should technically be my first fantasy comic that I've read. I, I don't want to say that, like, with a period at the end, uh, because i, I got to go back and look at some of the other stuff I've read. But I, I want to go read 18 Days right now. That's fantasy, right? Yeah, it's it's not written by Morrison, but it's all plotted by Morrison. Okay. I, um, I still but, want to go I mean, out and you, read it. <laughs> you can definitely tell Morrison's been all over that book, though, is the thing. Um, um, the, so reading this got me so enthusiastic about fantasy, of all things, which I'm just usually not really into. And so that's another thing that this, uh, this uh, book's got going for it. It got me interested in fantasy. I mean, it's it's absolutely gorgeous, which is the thing. I mean, you can't not fall in love with, with the charm of it just based on the art and then the writing of the characters, the way they talk to each other and the, the visuals you get to see from that is, I, I, I think, helps build into it. And so the, the fantasy aspect of it makes, or the fantasy aspect of the story makes the art um, feel kind of uh, like it's transcending normal things, and I, I feel like I'm losing my point here somewhere. Hopefully, you get what I mean. Oh, I, I get where you're coming from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just it, it, it has so much charm that you, you kind of fall in love with it, and and all we're really missing is Santa Claus fighting a dragon. <laughs> I know, but the Krampus with its big tongue is all close enough to a dragon, right? I mean, it almost breathes fire, or it does breathe yeah, fire, so I lights, guess, I guess the, point taken. Yeah, he lights the big douchebag on fire when he's like, I would say, you owe me! Ah! Um, that guy really reminded me of Worm, Worm Tongue from Lord of the Rings. Uh, I really, um, I, I want to say that, I think that one thing I really like about Morrison, and I like this pretty much all across the board from everything I've, I've read from him, I really like Morrison dialogue. Uh, what he does is, I can understand why it would turn people off, uh, but, and I think you can kind of see this across a lot of what he does, he pretty much just has his characters say what they need to say, he gets in, they say their piece, and then he gets out, and Morrison's more of like an ideas guy before he's like a, uh, a dialogue guy, he's not like a Quentin Same with Tarant Kirby. Yeah, same with Kirby. Uh, he's not necessarily like a Quentin Tarantino type writer, where it's all yeah, about it's the not, he doesn't write snappy dialogue. He doesn't, but... It's clever enough, and it informs the ideas enough, and it informs, and it gives you enough of a window into the character that it, it, it's efficient, and I like it. And um, I could see how some people would see it's awkward, but I think this heightened fantasy type is really playing into Morrison's wheelhouse as a writer of dialogue, and I really dig that. Yeah, and like I love to your point, he knows how to. Like, he doesn't know how to do witty, subtle exchanges very well, but you know what he is amazing at? Is big-ass, epic moments that are very impactful. And, and I'm looking at my favorite part of the book right here that not only perfectly just creates an, a great moment, but is just a perfect encapsulation of what Santa is, right? Mm -hmm. So you have it start off with Krampus. There is no Santa Yule night belongs to fear and cold and darkness now, now and forever, as all bad children belong to me. And then Claus comes in and he says, I say this, there are no bad children. Oh, so I good. fucking love that. <laughs> and, oh, that, and that, the way they handled the little bratty Damien child, I really like it. And it's, it's, one of those things where you could I, can, I, I want to write a paper on this about uh, Klaus and socialization and what it does to people and uh, I, I mean you, you could you know, like just how important important socialization is for the individual and like that that line right there that plays into the whole stuff that that's happening with the kid and the way the mother and, and that, even that my favorite scene of the book is the mother playing uh, with toys with a child um, that 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 whole exchange like what they're saying and the lines of dialogue, it's pretty clear what she's talking about, right? It's not like the, the, the dialogue's particularly subtle, but it's nuanced. It is, there's like, it's laced with double entendre. I mean, it's, that's why it's not subtle. The, the double entendre, the, the dual meaning there is so obvious, but it's okay. 
because it's playing into characters and the, the idea of Santa Claus and how he inspires other people. And that's the thing I'll say about this. This is a really inspiring piece of fiction. Like, it makes me want to go out and just be the jolliest person around and also, mm-hmm. like, punch evil people in the face. Like, it's so great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, I, I love the way Morrison writes heroic characters. He just, he really understands the, the idea of a sense of heroism behind things. Um, whereas I feel like a lot of people write, you know, superheroes, but just have them be like kind of shitty people, Mm -hmm. Uh, cough, cough, Alan Moore, subtle cough, subtle cough, (laughs) um, like Morrison knows what's inspiring about superheroes and he knows how to, you know, transcend that to mythology, what people find inspiring about mythology. And I really love that about it. Um, so I'm just looking at the back here and this was also in kind of the promotions and stuff. And one thing I don't like is when things blatantly lie. Yeah. Because right here on the back, Santa Claus is Santa Claus year one and finally answers the burning question, what does Santa Claus do the other 364 days a year? It doesn't do that. It does not do that at all. Like, I feel like whoever wrote that didn't read the book. Maybe that was Morrison's original pitch and then he just kind of decided to change everything. But... Yeah, that, that's not how you advertise the book. Yeah, it, it's just funny that they, they put that out there because that's not what happens here. Another awesome, big, just cool moment is uh, where they're all in the church and then the bells ring and they all run outside and there's the big rune in the snow and then he's standing on top of the uh, the church and he swings on the, the, the rope and he lights the tree on fire and he sends it down. Like It was such a cool, awesome moment. Like, I... Part of me just wants to see this as a movie. It'd be so This has been awesome. Nolanized Santa Claus. Yes! <laughs> Christopher Nolan. People class. need... People need dramatic examples to shake them out of apathy. <laughs> <laughs> Christmas tree on fire crashes down. <laughs> Let, let's do it. Let's... Nolanize everything! <laughs> just do it! Yeah, um, I also like... Nolanize Care Bears! Yes. Make it happen! Morrison can do it! Um... <laughs> I I like I like the rune. I think it's clever that that kind of becomes his calling card because yeah. it's like the rune for joy or whatever. Yeah, and they put it on his chin. Yeah. Um. One of the other two runes that we see the alien or not the aliens. Like I kept thinking of them as aliens. But <laughs> the forest spirit. creatures. What are the other two runes we see the forest creatures put on him? Through, like, flipping through you know, lake. Flipping through. Let's see. It is... This is like the sixth issue, right? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Like, I don't know anything about that kind of stuff. Um, okay, one of them looks like just an X, and the other kind of looks like a S or a lightning bolt, maybe. Yeah, I'm trying to remember what they are. Um, like, did you look it up or something? I, I didn't... Um, I'm trying to see if they had, like, mentioned it offhand. I gotta open up that bag. No, they didn't. I know they don't mention it, but I was just curious what those stand for. Um, I don't know. I got... I, I know, one thing, though, it really makes me interested in the mythology of where this comes from. I want to look up those runes and know what they mean. Yeah, yeah, that would be a good idea for someone doing a review of a book to do. Mm. That would that would be called uh, preparation and... <laughs> <laughs> Forethought. <laughs> I was just hoping you knew. I'm. Uh, I'm so sorry. I just finished reading the book. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, I was. I. I'm not. I'm not mad or anything. I'm just like I, I'm more talking about myself. That would be something <laughs> I should have done. Um, but I'm. It's Morrison. Nothing is is ever just a throw in. Uh, everything is always intentional with Morrison. Is the best way to think about it. Like. To the point where I was watching, uh, do you ever watch the Nerdist Because Science videos? Uh, no, I have not. Those are really fun. Uh, this guy named Kyle Hill, he'll uh, go through and talk about like how you know these things in sci-fi or whatever could actually be conceivably possible. Uh, oh. So he's done a lot of videos on like lightsabers and even did a video on like how a dragon could biologically exist. Um, and, and so it's just an interesting little thing. And he he does that with a lot of stuff, uh, and he did it with 
um, the Flash's um, infinite power punch, right? Infinite mass punch. Um, because in Morrison's uh, first arc of his Justice League run back in the 90s, the Flash runs around the Earth and accelerates to the point where when he punches, he's punching with infinite mass because of all the momentum he's built up. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And it's Morrison, so he actually th thought it through, and Kyle Hill goes through in the video and explains how it's not technically infinite, but it's so extreme <laughs> that it would, like, go flying for literally thousands of miles after getting hit with that. Speak um, speaking of flashes punching people in Morrison fiction, the uh, mm -hmm. the infinite flash punch across the multiverse at the end of Multiversity is one of my favorite things. <laughs> right. Yeah. So yeah, Morrison really does put a lot of thought into everything. So I know the runes are something. If one means joy, the other, like, I, just going off the top of my head with related to Santa Claus, the other probably means, like, merriment and love or something like that. Maybe, yeah. Um, I'm sure that it has some kind of connection to the fundamental things that Santa Claus is about. Mm -hmm. um, what those are, like, specifically in this, I don't know. But yeah, really fucking cool <laughs> one thing one thing i really dig and this is like the the issue with the flashback uh mm -hmm. um i love the flashback stuff and one th and this is just the stuff that that happens in say richard linklater movies or I, I don't know how to explain it and like most recently it happened with sing street which was a movie that came out earlier this year it's on netflix best movie of the year check it out uh but i love it when a when a piece of fiction can just reach through any and all uh, critical thinking I'm doing and just grab me by my core. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, I, and I can't explain it. It's, it just gets to me. And when I was reading those flashbacks, I was thinking, okay, this whole relationship between the... Uh, I keep wanting to call her my lady, but <laughs> because she has to be called by my lady, and now I'm thinking of Padme, but... Um, <laughs> And and the Klaus and there and in those early issues, like it's hinted at that there's a relationship. You should find the bird. And I was thinking, uh oh, I have a bad feeling about this. And then we got to that issue, and any sort it's of late Dagmar by Dagmar, there. yeah, that's not a very feminine name, but um, <laughs> she's a uh, so he's a uh, it, it reaches it just reached through me and just seeing their history together, it just added so much. And, and, it, and it, I all of a sudden could feel the history between those characters, and I thought it was a very smart and wise decision to have their conversation be uh, juxtaposed with their history. And when it comes back to the, that conversation between the two of them, there is a sense of history between these characters. There is a sense of, uh, like, mythology to them, like, even, like, you can feel the history before them in the town while they're children. I can't explain it. It's just, it's so rich. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, God, I just I fucking love this. So glad that I decided to pick this shit up. Um, man. It's just gorgeous, dude. <laughs> just fucking gorgeous. I, I don't know if I have anything bad to say about this, honestly. Like, that that's one of those things where... There are things that I thought I wouldn't like as I was reading it, and then I got to, oh, no, the payoff's just fine. And Yeah, yeah. Like, I don't know how someone could go, could look at this and go, oh, the dialogue's really hackneyed, and not realize that it's supposed to be a little, you know, tongue-in-cheek or a little over the top. Um, I don't know how someone could look at this and go, oh, the story's really stupid. It's a Santa Claus origin story. It, it has to kind of be a certain number of things that you would expect. I'd tell you right now, I'd much rather read this again than watch the, the Claymation Santa Claus origin. Yeah, with, what's that one called? Uh, Here Comes Santa Claus or whatever it is? Yeah, whatever that. With Chris uh, Kringle? Yeah. I thought it was funny that one of the guards has a big red beard. and I thought that was a little nod to the Chris Kringle Dalmatian. I, I have no idea. Um, I'd much rather, this is the definitive Santa Claus origin, you know, we were talking about Santa Claus the movie, uh, last time you were on, Connor, and that's, that's still pretty good, I, I still think that Oryx is weird as it is at times, but, no, this is, um, this is 
my new definitive Santa Claus origin. I so. I completely agree. I, I I haven't watched that one. Uh, I haven't watched Santa Claus the movie. I haven't watched the Dalmatian. I and I know that, and I, I've heard of them. I know of the what the origin plays on, but uh, I've never actually read something. But yeah, I I'd be hard pressed to find anything better than this. Yeah. Oh, side note when when I was last talking about um, the Santa Claus the movie. I'd said that I thought I was pretty sure Donner was involved. I was wrong, but in a really interesting way where I can totally see why I got it wrong. So Donner wasn't involved. It was done by the same guy who directed Supergirl, the movie. Oh, really? I think it's quite a bit better than Supergirl. Uh, I would. I, I I haven't seen either of them, but uh, I I think anything could be better than Supergirl from what I hear. Yeah, yeah, dude. I don't know. It's 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 a it's a weird little flick, but I like it. Um, this is still, yeah, this is, this isn't just fun. This is good, right? It is, absolutely. Like, that's, that's the important distinction I want to make here as, as we wrap up. This is, this is both fun and good, but it isn't just fun enjoyment. There is, like, legit, legitimately interesting, really cool ideas here that are, are paid off and set up and, and done really well. Um, the art, builds into the the art and the story are interwoven perfectly to give you a great great comic book or graphic novel whatever mm -hmm. um also note to note the person who directed santa claus the movie and supergirl also gave us jaws 2 so uh which is the best of the jaws sequels though that's not saying much <laughs> what when your competition is jaws the revenge and jaws 3d yeah. so the 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 thing I wanted to point out about the art is the way they he Dan Mora and especially just in the coloring, the stuff with the way daytime looks, the way it's not quite the way twilight looks, the way nighttime looks, just normal nighttime, but also nighttime by a fireplace, also nighttime under the northern lights, and mm -hmm. like there's that there's the scene in the flashback where he gets uh, exiled and then the wolf comes to comfort him. It was incredible, and I think that, like Miller's best work, Mora has a great sense of negative space. Mm. Uh, there's the part where uh, the, the worm tongue guy, he goes to the, the mine, and he's talking to what we assume is the Krampus through the big stone, mm. and he's got the book out, and that first panel of him standing there, so much of it is black. Yep. And it reminds it's me just of... Stuff like it is actually, you know, what's important is it's not just black. Like I'm looking at it under a light here, and there's there's little tiny lines of just that dark grayish purplish color uh, to give you a sense of the the scale of the wall. So it's not just a black space because that would assume the idea that it's going on forever. He's right. talking to a wall. It's just so massive and so dark. A space. Yeah, the, the detail's incredible. But I was reminded at many a times, especially like with stuff with the city and the way it interacts, I was I, I was reminded of uh, Frank Miller's best work from Sin City. Mm -hmm. uh, and the way they play with uh, the stones on the ground, the way uh, they just use negative space at times to accent action. It's really, really solid stuff. Dan Mora is an artist that I'm going to keep my eye on. Um, he is so, like, God, just 87, dude. That's Born in 87 and doing work with Grant Morrison. God damn, I'm jealous. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. Like, he does he does a fantastic job. You can almost see a bit of an anime influence in some of the way he draws. Yeah, I was, gonna, I was gonna say, I don't, I'm not a huge fan of Humberto Ramos as an artist, but there's that, that scene where he's gliding on the rope after he lights the, oh, before he lights the tree on fire and it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a sweet double page he has his own signature like hey if I drew that I put my signature on there too but uh, I was thinking this is what Ramos art should look like it is cartoony and exaggerated and you know very expressive and it does have a, uh, an eastern influence I see but it's not distractingly so mm -hmm. yeah yeah, I agree. Um, I'm looking at the page and just trying to see where the little... Hmm. 
Oh, yeah, I do. Wow. Yeah, he puts his signature in there. I like when they do stuff like that. I do, too. Subtle. Um, just in the background, it's not distracting. I thought yeah. that when, um, like, the, the pages were coming out of the the chimney, I thought that he would write his name on one of those. He didn't, but I thought he did. So That'd be a cool idea, too. That would be. Uh, I like, um, there's, there's a Zorro book, uh, from Matt Wagner's run, where the artist, um, I think it's Francisco Francavella. Ooh, dude, yes! I love that guy. Yeah, yeah, uh, there's, there's a big page where you got Zorro's Wanted posters put up for the first time, and under it you have a, like, really crude drawing of a guy, and it says, Francisco Francavella Wanted. <laughs> <laughs> So, so he put, that's how his clever way of inserting his own signature was. So I like when artists do stuff like that. Yeah, cause creative they, and clever. In, in that page, it kind of looked like a um, like a bit of graffiti or something. So That's yeah. really cool. I don't know if Francesco Francavilla did uh, Zorro. I gotta go back. I need to read that run. You've just been oh, it's, gushing it's over cool. it. And I, I really like Matt. The, so, the few stuff of Matt Wagner that I have read. Well, I mean, he's the one that did the uh, the Django Zorro book, so yeah, I, I know he. I don't know if he drew that though. Um, oh, Frank Avella didn't draw that, but Matt Wagner wrote that. Yeah, I, I've read very little stuff of Matt Wagner. I've read a little bit of Grendel, and I've read that. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I did meet him at Rose City Comic Con. He was really cool. So. Neat, neat. Yeah. Okay, are you uh, are you about out of things to say about Klaus? I am. I mean, I could just talk about every single detail of this, but that'd be a little bit of a moot point. I think pretty much everything from the writing, the dialogue, the ideas, the art, uh, everything about the art presents from the coloring, character design. Um, I got like voices in my head for each of these characters instantaneously. It, it's that expressive and get, does a really good job of presenting a, se- uh, a sense of place very well. Um, yeah, that's about mm-hmm. all I have to say. After doing that Larflee's motion comic, I'm just, like, kicking myself right now as I read comics going, oh, I can perfectly imagine, like, the right song to use here and the right, like, <laughs> da 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 And, yeah, I'm, like, with you. I got I, just the kinds of voices in mind for these characters I, re- I I've never really had much of an interest in motion comics, but reading this and I saw that you had done the Larflee's and I'm going to watch it a little bit later... Uh, but I was like, I kind of want to do a motion comic of this. I know exactly how I would do it. <laughs> so <laughs> Yeah, like, you just got the vision for it, right? I do! Oh, uh, yeah, I know how you feel. Because um, that's that's how I got my start on YouTube, was wanting to do the whole motion comic thing, but getting big projects together. I, I would say don't start with this. Start with just a single story. Right. Um, don't start with a big-ass project. Start with a one-and-done. Um but yeah, also, go check out the Larflee's Motion comic. Everyone listening to this, even though it's past Christmas that this episode will be up, go check out the Larflee's Motion comic. You'll enjoy it, I promise. Anyway, alright, Connor, let's go ahead and do a rating of Klaus. Um, I will give this 5 out of 5 fucking epic, scary-ass-looking Krampus. <laughs> And I'm going to give this 5 out of 5 hard nipples. Wait, that's not in the comic. Um... <laughs> I'll, I'll give this five out of five ho ho hoes. <laughs> that was so fucking cool! It oh my god! Oh so <laughs> uh, yeah, this is this is part of my Christmas uh, yearly tradition. Now I'm reading this every year. Um, I think I got to do it too. Yeah, go get yourself the hardcover. It's definitely worth it. Uh, it's fucking beautiful. Next to uh, watching the Twilight Zone episode, The Night of the Meek, and this, I I'm, I got a good got a good December every year now. Yeah, and then you can also watch the Larflee's Christmas special every year. <laughs> 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 plug, 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 plug. All right, everyone, thank you very much for watching um, this episode. Fan film reviews will return next week as we get back into. The normal swing of things on Geeky Gentlemen. I hope you all enjoyed the themed months of Geeky Gentlemen this last quarter of the year. Um, what else can I say? I don't know what fan film we're coming back with, but it'll be a surprise and should be fun. Connor, thanks again for joining me. Thanks for having me. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Everyone, until next time, I'm the philosopher. And I'm the guy. <laughs> no, 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 I got I got And I'm the Santa. <laughs> 
and we're your geeky gentlemen, and we will be discussing things. <laughs>